by the way, but God is good. It's good to be here this morning. We're going to talk about relationships today, but uh, before we do, let me just say that worship time, uh, as we were singing that last song, I just had a glimpse of that's what heaven's like. So just in case you're wondering what heaven is like, because we always try to wrap our mind around things we can't completely understand, that was just a small taste of what heaven is going to be like. Because I really feel like God came down and during that time of worship was just ministering to you and, and touching you and lifting burdens and giving you peace. Are you thankful for his presence today? Amen. And thankful for that time of worship and hopefully you're thankful for his word as well. Because we're going we're to talk about, as I said again, relationships and some of you are wondering why. Well, because you asked for it. Right? You asked for it, so we're going to talk about it today. And as we know, we're wired to have relationships, right? We're relational people to our core. When you look at the beginning of a scripture, when God created man, he said that it wasn't good for him to be alone. That we need to have relationships in our life. They're important. They're necessary. But having said that, I think we would also admit, though, that relationships are challenging. Can we do that? Can we admit that relationships are challenging, that sometimes they're difficult? Sometimes we struggle with them. We, maybe we don't feel like we've mastered the art of relationships. And I think there's some factors that play into this. I think there's some things that make it hard for us to just get along with people. And I think number one is this. We're just busy. I know we keep talking about this, but it just seems like life speeds up and gets faster and faster and faster. And we just don't have time for things that really, really matter. I mean, if you think about it, we make times for, for good things, but I don't know if we always make the time for the best things because we're just so busy. And I came across an article that said one in ten people today do not have a close friend. I think that's sad, and, and I think that's serious. And so I, I do think we need to talk about relationships t today, but we're busy. I think we would admit that they're also challenging because they're messy, Right? Relationships really don't come with an instruction manual. Sometimes there's bumps in the road. Sometimes we don't get along for various reasons and they're messy. And it makes relationships hard. Sometimes relationships are hard because we see people today as commodities. And that's due to the internet today. How many of you know that when it comes to relationships, all you have to do is go on Snapchat, go on Tinder. There's all these dating sites today. I mean, people are seen as something that you shop for today. And it's because of being online. Matter of fact, I was listening to a radio a couple weeks ago, and a guy was talking about how he liked to play tennis, but he couldn't find anybody to play tennis with him. That, that matched his skill set. So you know what he did? He went on Tinder... And he said he found a group on Tinder that was looking for tennis partners. That's how we view relationships today. I'll just go online. I'll do my shopping. Oh, they, they look like they fit my specifications. I'll reach out to them. So we see people today as commodities. And then the other thing that makes relationships hard is we don't live in public anymore. We live online. And that makes it difficult. See, you may do your shopping in public, you may do your hobbies in public, your chores in public, but there used to be a day when you lived in public. I mean, there used to be a day, like summer's kind of coming to close, I'm, I'm starting to get depressed, so pray for me. I really am, I'm like, oh dear Lord. But anyway, football's coming, so that's, that's a kind of a good thing, right? Anyway, but there used to be a day when the front porch is where people would hang out. And they would go and drink lemonade or coffee and talk and the kids would play and you'd catch up on the week or find out about those important things that were going on in people's lives. And that's no longer the case today. Instead of the front porch, there's the back porch. And it's fenced in because you don't want to be bothered by anybody. So relationships, we don't live them in public anymore. There used to be a day when you would go downtown to do your shopping. And that's where you would run into people and you would connect with people and find out how Bobby was doing and Susie was doing and how the kids are doing. Or you'd go to the public square. That's where life happened and that's where people gathered. But they don't do that anymore. 
And it sounds funny, but that even, I believe, was God's intention in starting the church. Because there used to be a time where people would go to church, not just to worship God, but to find out about people. How's your week going? How did your doctor visit go? Tell me about it. It was a time for people to connect and kind of recharge their batteries and, and, and just get to know each other. But we don't do that any longer. We don't live in public. We live online. And that makes relationships hard. It makes relationships challenging, right? And then relationships are challenging because it's just hard to get along with people. I mean, I heard somebody say this once, and we can laugh, but life would be great if it weren't for people, right? Because it's just hard sometimes, and so that's what we want to talk about today. How do we get along with people? And I think there's no better place to look to than to God's Word, and more specifically, what did Jesus say about people and relationships? And so, in Matthew chapter 5... We're going back to the Beatitudes, and if you were here last week, you, you remembered me saying that the Beatitudes, or the Sermon on the Mount, this was the sermon that Jesus preached that was telling his followers, we have to live countercultural. He was telling people there's, there's, a, there's a way of living that, that the people of the world seem accept, deem as acceptable, deem as okay, but Jesus, as he always does, said, I'm calling you to live countercultural. If you're going to follow me and be my disciple, I, I want to call you to a higher standard of living. And so he even talks about the higher standard of living when it comes to our relationships. And it's one verse. Matthew 5, verse number 9. Look at it with me. It'll be on the screen. Here's what Jesus says. God blesses those. How many of you want to be blessed today? then this is what we got to work on. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Now the NIV says it this way, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I want to talk to you today about how to be a peacemaker. Now notice that Jesus doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. Peacekeepers aren't blessed. And you want to know the reason why? It's because peacekeepers are only concerned about avoiding conflict. And how many of you know when you avoid conflict, you'll make excuses for things? How many of you know when you don't want to rock the boat, you won't talk to somebody who needs to have a talking to? Come on. How many of you know when you're a peacekeeper, the standards always change? One person is treated different than the other person. So Jesus says, when it comes to your relationships, I don't want you to be a peacekeeper. I want you to be a peacemaker. How many of you know that's raising the standard, guys? Because here's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker seeks the highest good. That's what they do. A peacemaker doesn't hold on to their rights. How many of you know we struggle in our relationships sometimes because we have rights and we've got to defend them and protect them at any cost? And when you hold on to your rights, you're going to stiff arm the people that God wants us to come alongside and love and have relationships. Because rights and relationships, believe it or not, butt heads don't go together. So a peacemaker gives up their rights. A peacemaker doesn't avoid conflict. Isn't that a novel thing? A peacemaker embraces conflict because they want to make peace. How many of you know when, when you avoid things, they don't get better? They get worse. Not only in your physical body or your emotions, but also in your relationships. If you just avoid that speck, that, that thing, whatever it is, it's going to build. And instead of bringing you closer together, it's going to push you apart. And so Paul talks about this in Romans 12. He says this. This is a good rule of thumb to live by. Paul says, never pay back evil with more evil. We kind of see that in the world today, right? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You hurt me, I hurt you even worse. Paul says, you don't pay back evil with more evil. Here's the higher standard of living again. He says, do things in such a way 
that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace. Now notice this word. What is it, church? With who? With who? With who? Oh, that's hard. That raises standard. It's not just the people that I have things in common with. It's not just the people that have the same way of thinking that I do. It's not just the people that like the same sports teams that I do. The best sports teams. <laughs> just seeing if you're with me, right? It's, we're called to love everyone and to live in peace with everyone. And then verse 21 says this, Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing what? Yeah, you, you've heard that expression before. All that it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do what? Nothing. Nothing. And that's kind of what Paul's saying. You want to overcome evil? You can't avoid it. You can't run from it. You have to address it head on. And you do that by doing the right things. And so how do we be peacemakers? Or maybe a better way of saying is, what does a peacemaker do and I just want to share a couple thoughts with you today and I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple suggestions on how we can do this okay you with me we, we need help with our relationships we want to get along with people here's number one so you're taking notes today a peacemaker speaks the truth in love listen to what Paul says Ephesians 4 he says we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ who's the head of his body the church. And I don't know how God speaks to you, but sometimes I read scripture and I get these thoughts. And, and I'm starting to learn when I feel like it's God speaking to me when it's not. And I think you're in that boat with me. And I read that verse and I had this thought that we usually don't have a difficulty with talking. I mean, we all have opinions and we came in with them today. We all have advice. We're not always afraid to share our advice or our opinions or our feelings, right? We, we don't really have a difficulty in talking. The difficult thing is loving. It's loving. And notice what Paul does, though. It's kind of complicated, but he says, I want you to speak, but I want you to speak the truth in love. So really what Paul's saying is love speaks, love talks, love has a voice. And if you think about that, how does love speak? Well, this may seem a little contradictory, but love, number one, listens. I heard somebody say it, but that's what love does. Love listens. I heard somebody say this the other day, and it was just a great reminder. They said that hearing is a sense. You know, we have five senses. But they said listening is a skill. And I think we're lacking the skill of listening today. And guess what? Love does that. Love is interested in what the other person has to say, even if it may be a different opinion than us. Come on, church. Love cares about the other person's point of view. Love wants to understand what was going into maybe their emotions or outburst or whatever it is. Love listens. And we need to do a better job with that. But then when love talks, guess what it does? It talks less. How many of you know the, the number one problem with our relationships is this right here? We say things, tweet things, butt into other people's business, spew our advice... And instead of it making things better, it often makes things worse. And the problem is we talk too much. I mean, we all do. I think that's a people problem. Why did James spend a whole chapter in the Bible saying that you can control ships with the rudder and horses with the bridle, but when it comes to the tongue, no one has been able to master it yet. It gets us in trouble, right? But love talks Less. And then I think love does this. It puts the other person first. How many of you would agree that's so important today? Because again, what we do when it comes to life and church and relationships and just in anything in general, our, our attitude is what's in it for me? 
How is this going to benefit me? How is this going to help me? And when we take that approach to our relationships, guess what? Instead of us having strong and healthy relationships, we're going to have shattered relationships. Because it has to be about the other person. And love does that. And then love is honest. And of course, we think about lying, don't we? That, that we should tell the truth and we shouldn't lie. But I also think that this is a dilemma in our relationships today. And I'll just throw it out there for you to think about and consider. But we don't reveal our true self to people anymore. We don't put ourselves out there. We, we only, we're, we're like public relation people today. You know what I mean by that, right? We, we only want to put the best side of us out there. We don't really want people to know who we truly are. Now here's the thing though that we've got to understand. That's being dishonest. When we enter into relationships, and, and I, I get it, it takes time. But if we're always holding back and not opening ourselves up to the other person and, and revealing who we truly are, we're lying to them. We're being dishonest to them. And how many of you know relationships are built on trust and honesty, not on lies and dishonesty? So love is honest. Not just with our words, but our life. And we're open. But I really want to focus on this today. And it's this last thought. How does love talk? Well, love admonishes. And that's a crazy word. We don't use that word much today. And I don't know if it's taught about much today. But it's biblical, in case you're wondering. Uh, Romans 15, Paul says this. He says, I'm, I'm confident concerning you, my brethren, that you're also full of goodness. You're filled with all knowledge. Now notice this. You're able also to do what? To admonish one another. Now, here's the idea behind admonishing. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. And you're going to see this later, but what Paul was saying is that as the body of Christ, as Christians, as, as people who have made this decision to put Jesus first and say, you're the Lord and Savior of my life, then Paul's saying when it comes to the church and the body of Christ, we need to admonish one another. And that's not a suggestion again. It's command. Now, let me give you the difference, though, because sometimes I think we think admonishing means judging. Here's what judging is. There's a difference between judging and admonishing, by the way. Judging means this. It means that you see something that disagrees with your opinion. That's what judging is. And again, we all have opinions. We all have ideas and thoughts of how life should go and how people should live and Right? And when somebody doesn't go according to that standard or our opinion, we judge them. We do. Now, in case you're wondering, it's not wrong. This is going to shake some feathers, but in the, the truth sets us free, right? In the biblical sense, it's not wrong to judge. Do you know why? Because Jesus said you will know people by their fruit. So what does that mean? Well, when they say one thing and act a certain way, it's like, hey, come on, you said this, but I don't see this. Now, should we go around judging people? Not necessarily. There's a higher standard of living, right? And here's where it is. It's admonishing people. And here's the difference. Admonishing is when you see somebody living their life and it doesn't line up with scripture. You go to that person and you talk to them honestly and openly because you're concerned about them. Ooh, pastor. What? Yeah. Yeah. Because the goal of admonishing is to lead someone to a specific action. Now let me show you how this works. Because this is a perfect example. And then, and then we'll look at what admonishing isn't. Okay. Every Sunday when you hear a sermon. 
a message, whether it's from me or somebody else. Admonishing is what is happening. That's what's happening. Now, sometimes you will think, oh, well, pastor, you're reading my mail. You're, you're talking, how'd you know what was going on in my life? See, the thing is, I don't. But I do know what scripture says. And when we hear God's word, how many of you know it admonishes us? It opens our spiritual eyes. To see something maybe in a way that we haven't seen it before. Or maybe it's just to remind us of something. But how many of you know God's word always, 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 if we're open to it, will admonish us? Now here's the good news. Sometimes we walk out of here and it's like we're on cloud nine. Like, man, I feel encouraged and I just feel overflowing with joy and I just have this peace. But then there are other times when God's word nails us right between the eyes. And instead of saying like, praise the Lord, it's like, oh my. And sometimes it's hard, isn't it, gang? But what is the purpose of admonishing? It's to get us to take a specific action, a specific step. And how many of you know the Bible says the steps of the righteous, come on church, are what? Ordered by the Lord. So God admonishes us. And as his people, he wants us to admonish his people. Now let me paint this picture though, okay? Is this helping? All right, here's what admonishing is not. Isn't. Is not. Okay? Admonishing, again, is not judging someone who doesn't conform to your standards. That's not admonishing. Admonishing is not talking down to someone. Admonishing is not putting someone in their place. That's not admonishing. Admonishing is not being critical of someone. Come on now. Admonishing is not gossiping about someone. Did you hear about so-and-so and what they're doing and where they were? That's a sin, by the way. Just reminding us, right? Gossip is not admonishing. Admonishing is not winning an argument. It's not, I have a point and I'm going to prove my point no matter what. That's not admonishing. Okay? And admonishing is not making statements to a group. Because again, here's what we'll do sometimes. Instead of talking to the person, we'll send out little innuendos. When they're with us and we're in a group of people, we'll say little things that we hope they hear that will cause them to act differently. Come on, you know we do that as people. You can smile, it's okay. I know it. We all do that from time to time. But that's not admonishing. And admonishing is not a one-time thing. Now, this is so important to hear because, again, we can have this attitude as well. Well, I went to so-and-so and I talked to them, but they didn't receive it and they didn't listen. And so our attitude is, I, I just washed my hands and I'm done with them. I did my part. How many of you know admonishing keeps coming back? It doesn't give up on someone. It's not a one-time thing. And so I, I hope by now you're, you're asking yourself, well, how do I admonish then? If, if I'm commanded to do this, what does it look like? How do I do it? Let me give you a couple steps. Number one is this. It has to start with the relationship. And let me just say, I think admonishing is hard today in the church because we're maybe not as connected to people as we need to be. See, admonishing is not walking up to a stranger or someone on a street corner and, and just preaching hellfire and brimstone to them. Can that have a place? I guess it can. But oftentimes it does more harm than good. Because you don't have a relationship with someone. That is so important, church. We're, we're going to admonish people. We've got to have some kind of common ground with them. We, they can't be a stranger. Are, are you hearing me? It starts with the relationship, but then it goes a step further. And admonishing has to be grounded in God's word. Why is this so important? Because again, admonishing is not about trying to advance your agenda. And it's not trying to force your opinion on someone. Matter of fact, it is not about what I think, what I feel, or what I want. 
It's what God says and what God wants. That's hard to discern sometimes, isn't it? But it needs to be grounded in God's word. So can I, can I just build on this idea for a minute? I think admonishing is difficult because we're maybe not as connected to people as we need to be. And it's also difficult because we don't know God's word the way we need to know God's word. Oh boy. But again, it's not my opinion. It's not what, you know, my grandparents taught me growing up that I'm trying to pass on to you. It's what does God's word say? That's what we speak into people's life. Because how many of you still believe that the truth is what sets us free? So we've got to speak the truth. And we've got to know the truth. And that's found in God's word. Right? Let's go a step further. You've got to talk to God first. You're going to admonish somebody? You need to get God's point of view. How many of you know you've got to get your thoughts to line up with God's thoughts and your heart and your motive to line up with God's hearts? Come on, somebody. We don't just run in to it the minute there's a problem and just start spewing everything. We need God's wisdom and God's direction. We need to know, hey, do I need to bring somebody with me who can help? Whatever it is, but we've got to talk to God first if we're going to admonish people. And then... Here's the next thing we need to do. We need to be tactful. This isn't preached about much anymore. But let me tell you, as the people of God, we need to be tactful. And that is a skill. And some of you are looking at me like, what does tactful mean? Is that the thing that you stick into a bulletin board? Is that the thing I've stepped on before and it's gone in the bottom of my foot? Tactful? What does that mean? Well, here's what tact is. It's the ability to make a point without making an enemy. Ooh, come on, somebody. We need to make a point without making an enemy. Let me just tell you what you're seeing today. People are good at making enemies. But we're not very good at having tact. And when you spend time in God's word and in God's presence and you talk to God first, I truly believe he'll give you and me tact. That we can talk to someone and make them know that we're for them and we're not against them. We're not trying to belittle them or whatever. We're trying to help. Right? And then here's the last thing. And I think all those are difficult, but this might be the hardest one. Admonishing needs to happen face to face. Now let me tell you what the church likes to do. Because I've grown up in church. So I can, I can talk about experiences. Is that okay? Because I know sometimes how church folk think. And here's what church people will do. They like to send anonymous letters. That's what church folk like to do. Oh, God put this on my heart. And so I'm just going to speak to you. But I'm not even going to put my name on it. I know you, go, you all don't do it here. So let me, let me just remind you though, stop it. Alright? Admonishing needs to happen face to face. Now again, we've got modern technology, right? Don't send an email to somebody. Don't text somebody. Don't tweet somebody. Or what all this other technology is today, I can't keep up with it. You talk to them face to face. That's biblical, by the way. A peacemaker speaks the truth in love. I got to speed up. Is that okay? I, I know it. I got to speed up. Here's, here's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker doesn't say sorry. James chapter 5 James says this, Confess your sins to each other, pray for each other, so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Here's what a peacemaker does. They don't make excuses. I thought of getting an amen. 
I was waiting for it. That was your, that was your cue, church. A peacemaker doesn't make excuses. It was so-and-so's fault. I, I, whatever. We don't make excuses. A peacemaker admits and they own up to their actions and attitudes. Here's what a peacemaker does. They are responsible for the part they play. Now, let, let me just kick the field goal. You know when you kick the field goal, it's got to go between their up, the, the, the uprights. Thank you, somebody. Right? It's got to go through the uprights. So here it is. And again, this is with love, and it's just a reminder. A relationship is made up of at least two people. Both those people bring things to the table. Bring things to the relationship. I'm a firm believer, by the way, that in most instances, there is not just one innocent party. That we've brought something to that relationship, whether good or bad, whether positive or negative. We bring things to our relationships. And a peacemaker owns up to it. A peacemaker says, you know what? Yeah, I did that. I did it. I'm sorry. But I had a part to play in this thing. There's not just one innocent party. How many of you have heard that expression before? When you point a finger at someone, there's like three or four, if you can get your thumb back the right way, pointing right back at you <laughs> and me, right? So that's why I talk like an Italian and I just go like this. <laughs> I'm just trying to help. But you know where I'm going. Now, here, here's the interesting thing. James 5 James, we just read this, he makes a distinction between remorse and repentance. Okay? James 5 is not saying be remorseful. Because here's what remorse means. It means I made a mistake and I'm sorry. Now see, to our, to our natural ears, that sounds good. And, you're, and we're thinking, well, pastor, what in the world? But here's the importance of this. Please lean in for just a second. Sorry is polite. That's good manners. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. Sorry is polite. But sorry lacks power. Sorry lacks the potential to bring about change. So think about your life for a minute. Or just think about the people that you know in your life for a minute. What do we hear a lot of times? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And here's the thing. You, you really look at it from an objective point of view. That person has been saying sorry for five years. And their life has not changed. They're still dealing with the same old crap and the same old garbage. I'm just preaching real today. And you think to yourself, why? And you may even think that when it comes to your life. I'm sorry. So why can't I kick this thing? Why, why can't I find victory over this thing? I'm sorry. And the truth is this. Sorry lacks power. There's no power in sorry. And so God, again, takes things to a higher level. Because I want you to hear about God. God wants to bring about life change to you and me. Life change starts right inside of here it starts with our heart and sorry can't change our heart but the presence of God can so how do we open up our heart to the presence of God it's not sorry it's repentance here's what repentance means God, I have sinned against you. And I have sinned against somebody else. When we have that posture, church, and that attitude, it opens up our heart to the power and presence of God to change our life. Because repentance means, first of all, there's a God. Our world's trying to push God further and further away. Don't think about the Bible. Don't talk about the things of God. Whatever it is. God's out of the picture. Well, our world's crazy. 
And people are sorry. And you still got all this mess happening. Because it can't change this right here. And so when we get to that fact, that, uh, to that point, that there's a God in heaven. And there's a God in heaven who loves us so much that he gave us a standard of living. He gave us a standard of what is called right and what is called wrong. I don't get to determine that standard. I need to say that again. That standard has been written in stone. Literally. And so repentance means, uh uh-oh, there's a God in heaven, and he has a better way of living for my life, and I haven't been doing that. I've hurt his heart. I broke God's heart. That's repentance. And then repentance goes the second mile, because you need to hear this too. Sin doesn't just affect us. It affects the people in our life. Sin doesn't just hurt us. It hurts the people that we love and care about. And so we not only make things right with God, and here it is, gang, we don't go to God and say, sorry. We go to God and say, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your law and your word. Will you forgive me? And the Bible says that he will. But then you go to that person that you wronged and that person that you hurt, and you say the exact same thing. I was wrong. I sinned against you. Will you please forgive me? That's repentance. And that's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker doesn't say sorry. A peacemaker repents. And then the last thing is this. A peacemaker forgives. Colossians 3, Paul says, make allowance. Let this sink in for each other's what? Yeah, you know what he's saying? Just like I got an allowance growing up, some of you did too. If you did your chores, you could expect to get what? Cash money. Yeah, you could expect that. So what Paul's saying is we live in this fallen world. We live in a world that's full of what? What was the last count? Eight billion people or so? So Paul's saying this, just understand, somebody's going to hurt you. Somebody's going to do you dirty. Somebody's going to rub you the wrong way, right? We all have faults. He says, make allowance for each other's faults and do what? Forgive anyone. That's great. Now let's go to the next word, who does what? Offends you. And then he says this, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must what? Forgive others. So Paul's saying, just know this, people are going to hurt you, you're going to hurt people. Hurting people hurt people, right? But here's the goodness of God though. And here's the power of the gospel. Paul's saying, though you might get hurt, don't let that hurt harden your heart. Don't let that hurt make you bitter. Don't let that hurt get inside of you. Because it will. Paul says, remember that Forgiveness is powerful. I like what uh, Louis Sand Smead said. He said this, To forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. That's forgiveness, right? We, we get bottled up sometimes because people did us wrong and we're upset and we're nasty towards them and we're not going to forgive them. And it doesn't hurt the other person necessarily. It hurts us. Traps us. And, and so I just want to leave you with this. What's, what are the indicators that we're living in the last days? Because some of us, with, with this series, that was your question. What, what does the Bible say about the last days? So here's just taste, okay? In Matthew 24, Jesus' disciples pulled Jesus aside one day and said, Master, what are the signs that we're living in the last days? How do we know that, that you're going to come back again? That, you, that your return is soon. And Jesus lists some things. Those of you that grew up in church right now, you can think about these. What does he say? He says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Check. We see that happening all the time, right? He says there are going to be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Check. We see that all the time. He says this. Pers- people will be persecuted for following Jesus. 
We hide our head in the sand when it comes to this. These numbers have probably changed by now. But the last numbers I saw, 100,000 Christians a year are being persecuted, killed for their faith. It's happening. Jesus said it would. And then he goes on and Jesus says that people will reject God's law and reject God's will. Check, we see that happening today. I don't really give a flying flip about the Bible and what God has to say. I'm the God of my life. I can do whatever I want to do. You see that happening today. But then Jesus, in his wisdom and sovereignty, spoke not only to that day, but spoke to our day. And that's why I want to just affirm you, the Bible is still relevant for 2019. Because notice what Jesus says, Matthew 24, verse 10. How do you know we're living in the last days? He says, and not just some, a few. He says, many will be offended. They will betray one another, and they will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And let me just tell you, some of what you're hearing today is a counterfeit gospel. It's all, you're offended. Well, let me come in and make you feel all good. Let me tell you what you want to hear. Not what will set you free. Can I just preach? Is that okay? And he says this. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So let me tell you what you know. People are offended by anything and everything today. I, I'm preaching this message and I'll probably get comments by somebody that said, I don't like what you said, Pastor. That just offends me. And I want to say this with all love. Just get over it. I got to get over it. Right? Because here's the thing. We see that in the world, but then we don't want to take a look at ourselves. And my concern is that many in the church today, many people who profess to love Jesus with their heart, are choosing to be offended. Because it's a choice. And I like what Bill Kellogg said. He said this, if you are on a continuous search to be offended, you will always find what you're looking for, even when it isn't there. So, so how do we not be offended? Just quickly. Worship team's coming. We're going to pray. We need to believe the best in people again. Can I just tell you, we're, we're too quick to write people off. We're too quick to jump to conclusions. Don't we do this? Sometimes people say things and the way they said it, that's not how they meant it. But we always assume the worst. How about we just believe in people again? How many of you know they're made in the image of God, the likeness of God? They're precious. They're valuable. We need to honor people, right? We need to believe in people. That's how we avoid being offended. You want to avoid being offended? Just give grace. Because let me remind you what grace is. It's a garment. And every day, just like you and I get dressed, every single day, we need to put on grace. Because... Sometimes we can very easily be offended. And instead of giving in to that, we need to say, I, I love you. I'm giving you what you don't deserve. How many of you know that's grace? Now somebody said this, just keep it in mind. They said, when we choose to be offended, we're creating a boundary of separation without any space for what reconciliation or understanding. See, that's really what's happening today. I'm offended, so you're dead to me. I write you off. You don't live in my mind any longer. I wash my hands of you. I'm through with you. And how many of you know that creates separation? And the world is crying out today. Let's just come together. Let's just love each other. Well, you can't when you're offended all the time. Because it pushes people away. And it creates separation. We need to give grace. Give grace. We need to forgive. How many of you know God's forgiven us, right? He's given us things that we don't deserve. We need to forgive people. 
And then I think the big thing is this. We just have to die to ourself. How, how do you get over being offended? Just die to yourself. And a pastor said this. I found this quote. He said, dead men never get offended. What did Paul say? It's no longer I that live. It's Christ that lives in me. If anybody could have been offended, it could have been Paul. And you know what he did? He forgave people. He loved people. He died for the gospel, didn't he? Jesus said this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. You want to be a peacemaker? Speak the truth in love. Don't say sorry. Repent. And forgive people. Will you stand with me today? I'm going to pray. Hey, thanks for watching our message today. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe below so you'll be updated on the latest messages as they're loaded. You can also give us a thumbs up and let us know how we're doing in the comments section. Thanks again for watching us and have a great day.